Okay. All right, guys, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful for this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given to us. Thank you for what we have experienced as we have listened to the music and sang along, as our hearts have been stirred from uh, dialogue and conversation one with another and hearing the word and prayer and just spending time in your presence. Thank you for the privilege. As we continue to sit for a few moments now, we pray that your spirit will superintend all that is said and stir our hearts, oh God. And Father, don't let us leave from this conversation with you uh, the way we have come in. Uh, we want our lives to, to be filled with your presence and to always bring honor and glory to you. So Lord, we're your people. We're sitting in your presence. We want to hear from you. Speak to our hearts, for we are listening, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Um, this morning, our message is entitled, Chosen, Chosen. And before I begin into the message, I want to start by raising a question, asking a question of you, and let you ponder it for just a moment. And you may want to write it down and contemplate it a little more during the week. But I felt impressed this morning as I was having uh, my personal devotion or devotional time. Uh, the question came to my mind, how might your life or my life, how might your life be different if you trust Jesus more? If you trusted him more than what you do presently, how might your life be different? Just ponder that for a moment. How might your life be different if you trusted Jesus more? Okay, with that, um, think on that for just a moment. We want to look at a subject today entitled Chosen. And basically I have uh, three significant questions or areas that I want to to frame our, our dialogue, our, our talk here this morning. And it's more or less that um, maybe I'll, I'll start to preach, but I want to just kind of share and teach and use several scriptures as we go through uh, this morning. The first text that I want to join you to join me with is John 15 and verse 16. John 15 and verse 16. And I'm just call, recalling as I turn there that there was a passage in Ephesians uh, that I had written down, I believe it was Ephesians uh, two or three, I believe it was, but maybe I'll find it somewhere in my notes as we go on this morning. But um, that talks about being chosen as well, uh, that passage in Ephesians. Um, but here we look to uh, John 15 and verse 16 to get us started for the day. I have chosen, I have not, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. And you can see very clearly, I think, in this passage that there are several things that we could spend quite a bit of time on. Uh, the fact that he has chosen us, and that's what I want to look at today, um, uh, that we have not uh, chosen him, but he has chosen us. And then being chosen, he has ordained uh, that word is probably more like appointed. It's not so much uh, putting oil on us. But then again, if you want to accept it in that context, I think that would apply too, in the sense that not only has the pastor been ordained to serve, yes, I've been ordained to, to do the, uh, uh, the sacraments of the church, so to speak, but 
then each of us, whether minister, pastor, uh, chaplain, whatever it is, uh, are ordained by God, set apart. That's what it really means, set apart, uh, appointed, set apart, sanctified, it would be the word, uh, uh, appointed, uh, given an assignment, ordained by God. And for what? That we might go and bring forth fruit. Uh, I want to talk about fruit uh, a little bit today, but uh, chosen, and then uh, we want to look at that whole idea of, of fruit. So as we, we move forward, our sermonic sentence today is, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee, you. The God of our fathers has chosen thee, you and me. Uh, we are chosen uh, by him. So when we think then of being chosen, um, I think of various criteria uh, that we use for choosing things. For instance, uh, if we're choosing a fruit, we use a criterion, uh, I, I choose a fruit based on its nutritional value. And it means that when I choose that I have options, I have choices. And amongst those choices, I choose that which is most nutritious for me, has the most nutritional value. Uh, while looking at fruit, I may choose the fruit based on its goodness, its sweetness. Uh, it's, uh, I may choose it by its ability to satisfy uh, my, my, my urge for the moment, whether it be for something sweet or to, to something that's was more likely to stick to me that will satisfy my hunger. Or I may buy the fruit or choose the fruit based on how it looks, how it smells, and how it tastes. And nine times, if not 9.999 times, it is not going to be durian. <laughs> if you've ever smelled durian and eaten durian, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's not my favorite food. It's, it's quite smooth once you, once you cut it and get into it, but it, it's not my ideal food to, to even be around. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So that's how we look at fruit. This is a criterion we use to choose our fruit. And then uh, if we were choosing a vehicle, we may choose a vehicle based on its performance, uh, the, the, the gas mileage that we might derive from it. Uh, we, we would choose the vehicle based on the ride, the quality of the ride or its functionability, how it holds the road, its durability, how long the vehicle is subject to last, uh, we, we buy the vehicle based on its looks and even on its cost. There are various criteria that we use to, to purchase or to choose the vehicle. Uh, when I'm looking for a player, I, I'm choosing a, a team to play, whether it be a uh, Dutch blitz or uh, or a basketball game or, or a round of football or something we're doing of, those, of that nature. We choose an individual to participate on our team based on the anticipated performance, how we think they are going to perform. We suspect that they will perform well based on their ability, based on their experience, all of this uh, it comes into the equation of choosing. And then if I'm choosing, let's say clothing, I choose clothing based on its functionality, its comfort, its style, my own personality, the way it looks, the way I look in it. Um, those are some of the reasons that we choose. When we come to our semantic senses that tells us that the God of our fathers, God, creator, has chosen thee, has chosen us, you and me. Then we, we come to recognize that 
with all of these uh, options and with the billions of people in the world to recognize that it is me, <laughs> me that he has chosen, that I, you, that we are not an accident, that you and I, we are not a mistake. We are not a mistake. Um, standing in uh, St. Peter's uh, um, uh, Cathedral there in Rome back in uh, 2008 and looking up uh, at the, uh, in the Sistine Chapel there, uh, observing that magnum opus of um, uh, Michelangelo there, uh, that, 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 that he had crafted uh, of the, the, the finger of God reaching uh, to the outstretched hand of the created Adam on the other part of that, uh, of the ceiling there. Uh, it is inconceivable looking at that, 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 that marvelous uh, painting rendition uh, to suspect that uh, it was shaped and, and, and painted, that that masterpiece was, was put there on the spot by Michelangelo that it's just inconceivable to think that he did not imagine that first and sketch out how he was going to do that. So when we see a, 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 a master artist uh, plan and anticipate the, the major work that he wants to achieve, then we, we, we consider that God himself in creating man, you and I, that God had a plan in mind. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a passage in um, uh, Psalm 139. It puts it this way. That's a very beautiful chapter to read. But Psalm 139, uh, beginning at verse 13, just paraphrasing from the uh, New Living Translation. It says, you are the delicate inner parts of my body. You made them the inner parts of my body and knitted me together in my mother's womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Here the psalmist is saying, Lord, you know me. You know my integral parts, you know my thoughts, my motives, and, and you had my life planned out before I was born, before I was conceived, you had already had a place for me. You had a plan for my life. And you can go back with that to Jeremiah 29, where he says, uh, I know the plans, the thoughts that I have to, for you to give you a hope in the future. He has a plan with you in mind. As a matter of fact, he has a plan for you. And, and one of the, the purposes of our lives is to discover that plan and to live it out, to allow God to work out his plan in us and through us. Another passage in Galatians uh, 1.15, uh, still again in the uh, New Living Translation says, but even before I was born, God chose me and call me by his marvelous grace. Even before I was born, Galatians 1.15. Moreover, in uh, the NIV, uh, in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, it says, but even before I was born, uh, it says in, in, in Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, he's speaking to Jeremiah, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I set you apart before you were born. All praise to the Father. <laughs> and now I'm looking at Paul in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 uh, verses uh, 3 and, and, and 4. Again, in the uh, New Living Translation, it says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing, spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because 
we are united with Christ. Even before the world, he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ. I love that notion. Now, when you look at that passage, I want you to, to look very carefully because Paul uses this uh, uh, in Christ idea, this in, in, uh, in Christ motif, uh, we, we classify it as, that he loved us and chose us, not just arbitrarily, uh, chose us out here uh, in, in nothing, but in Christ, as he has chosen his beloved, he has chosen us in him. If you are chosen, uh, 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 Dwight Nelson says, uh, the pastor of M M uh, the church there at, at Andrews University, uh, PMC, he says that if you are God's chosen, then that can only mean that he has a destiny for you, a very unique mission for a very unique creation. And get that, quoting him again, that if you are God's chosen, then that can only mean that you, uh, that he has a destiny for you, a very unique mission for a unique creation. <laughs> Have mercy. And then, of course, just last uh, uh, Wednesday, we were in prayer meeting and we came across this passage. Now, talking about being chosen and God having for us a unique place and a unique mission, we read in Christ's Object Les Lessons, page 326, that each has his place in the eternal plan of God, each of us, that each is to work in cooperation with Christ for the salvation of souls. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is the special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. Now get this, because I'm setting up the stage now, that God had some choices uh, of the billions he has chosen you. And, and, and how do I know he's chosen you? Because here you are uh, called out of darkness into this marvelous light. You are here chosen by God, chosen with a purpose and a plan uh, for your life, for the advancement of his kingdom through you and me. He has given us a work. And then Christ's Object Lessons uh, brings it home to us that no surely then there's a place for us in eternity with him, then there's also a place for us here on earth designated by him for us to work. And then if you add Dwight Nelson's statement there that he has a destined for us, a mission. He's created us for a unique mission. And each of us has a unique mission and purpose in this world. I, as the pastor, or I, period, cannot do your work. Don't expect me to give you to do your work. Don't seek to abdicate your responsibility. Your spouse cannot do your work. Don't leave your work, which God has designed, has designated for you to do, to leave for someone else to do. You and I must take up the mantle and do that for which we've been called to do. So now here's my uh, second question I want to put to you uh, for the morning. So why has Jesus Christ chosen you and me? Why has he chosen you and me? We look at that text in John 15 and verse 16. And it says clearly that he, that we, ye, uh, should go forth and bring forth fruit. So don't miss that. So the first thing is that we should bring forth fruit. Now I have two passages of scripture I want us to read. Look with me, if you will, to Isaiah. We've been studying that beautiful chapter, beautiful book uh, this quarter. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 26. Uh, correction, verse 6, Isaiah 27 and verse 6. And let's look, see what he says here. I think this is my correct passage. L listen to this. <laughs> this, is, this is powerful. He shall cause them, his children, his people, 
that come out of Jacob, you and me, to take root, Israel, modern Israel, you and me, shall blossom and bud. I love that. And fill the face of the world with food. So, I'm sorry, I said food, I meant fruit. <laughs> that we should fill the world with fruit. So we read in John 15, 16, that we are to bring forth fruit. This is why he's chosen us. I remember when uh, I, I bought a uh, an apricot tree. I, I, I preached about that tree before. And, and of course, uh, it, it's applicable to this, um, to this message as well, because that tree eventually uh, stopped producing and I gave it uh, sufficient time and it never did bring forth what I anticipated that it would do. Hence, I cut it down. I got rid of it. We'll come to that later on. But the point is that that we, I, I chose the tree so that it might bring forth fruit. I didn't bring, buy it and purchase it for a shade and its beauty. I purchased it for the benefit that I might eat of this fruit. God has chosen you and me in John 15, 16 with the ideal that we will bring forth fruit. We look in Isaiah now 27 verse six and he says that, that we will fill the face of the world with fruit. Now, the question is gonna be what kind of fruit? And we'll look at that a little bit better uh, as we get into it. What kind of fruit? Uh, succulent and luscious and juicy and sweet and fragrant. That kind of fruit or bitter, uh, rotten, you know, that type of thing. So hold that from Isaiah 27, six. Now let's look to Acts chapter 22, Acts 22. Uh, and then if you look with me, verse 6, 14, again, another beautiful passage. And I hope you'll come back to these passages and, and read them later on. Uh, Acts 22, I'm going in the wrong direction. Acts 22, and let's begin with verse 14. And we may not get to 16, but let's see. And he said, and this is, is the experience of Paul when uh, he meets uh, Ananias, you know, he was on the road. I think I mentioned it a Sabbath or two ago that uh, on the road to Damascus, uh, to Damascus, he was blinded by the light. Remember that? And uh, it is this experience. He went down or he was led into the town on Straight Street where he met Ananias. And there Ananias prayed for him. And this is part of that conversation and experience now in verse 14. And he said, the God, Ananias is speaking to him, the God of our fathers has chosen thee, our, her sermonic sentence, he has chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see the just one and should hear his voice, the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, wash away thy sin. Call on the name of the Lord. So beautiful passage, beautiful passage. So what we see here then that Paul was chosen specifically. God had a mission for him, uh, a place designed for him. And so it is with you and me. We are called specifically because God has a plan for us. And that is one, that you and I should produce fruit. That's what he wants from us is fruit. Now, when I read this passage, particularly Isaiah 27, John 15, we talk about fruit. I see this fruit as having a uh, double meaning. First, it means Christ-like character producing Christ-like character. And I, I love this passage. If you go back to John, he says that the fruit might remain. In other words, if you are a Christian today, if you can be loving and kind today, let that fruit remain tomorrow as well and the following day. Don't be uh, vacillating and uh, uh, one day you're, you, you're, you're very moody, the next day you're happy and excited, 
uh, give yourself to God and let the attributes of his character always come forth with integrity. Today, you're filled with integrity. Tomorrow, you're a little crooked and backward. And in this way, in this situation, you're one way. In a different situation, you are another. Be the same. Be consistent. Be a Christian consistently. So we're talking about developing Christ-like character. And a while back, we um, we did the whole series on uh, the road to character, looking at Galatians 5.22, I believe it was, the fruits of the Spirit. And this is what we're talking about, developing fruit. This is what he wants, that you and I would develop Christ-like character and continue to develop like him. And then, uh, this is the double meaning. Now, the first is the, the Christ-like character. Secondly, is that we would produce souls. Yes, that we would win souls, that we would add to the communion of the saints, that we would add to the church. So we have two things we're looking at then here in this double meaning, that he expects fruit from you and me. He expects for us to develop Christ's likeness, his character, fruit. And then he expects us also to bear fruit, to add to his church. Now, in the grace, uh, of, the, uh, in the grace of the person's character, Christ-like character, this is how he wants to develop because these are often the means of successful evangelism. So I choose, I, I'm, I'm pointing out the Christ-like character first because it is fruitless, <laughs> if I may say that. It, 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 is, it is emptiness to try to do evangelism, to try to win someone to Christ if you are acting like the devil. If you are resembling more of the devil's characteristics and traits, uh, his works, uh, more so than Christ's character, uh, then it's going to be very difficult to win people to Christ. So when individuals come to, to worship with us, the, the first thing they see is whether or not we have the character, the characteristics or the traits of Christ as they meet us at the door. As they converse with us, they can look at our countenance and see how well we are doing in developing Christ-likeness. And then that becomes a catalyst for evangelizing. If you are all sad and morose and that's your constant way of, of greeting and meeting people with a complaint or, or some bickering of, about something, who wants to be a part of that? That is not a good evangelist. But if you are filled with the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord is your strength, then as others see you, in spite of the times that you are having difficult situations, and they see how you deal with your trouble, that you do have a God in your life, in spite of what is going on with you, then he or she wants to know your God. That's the idea. You see, if we are purporting to, to, uh, to bring people to Christ, to add to the church, and we ourselves don't represent him, that is a problem. That is what Paul would call uh, sounding brass and a tingling cymbal, uh, a bunch of noise signifying nothing and we can't get anywhere from that. So we, we first develop those Christ-like characters. And then we want to begin adding to the body of Christ. I, I think about, uh, as we th think in terms of Christ calling us and saying that he wants us to bear, to bring forth fruit, um, uh, both uh, character and individual or souls. I think of the, 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 the cow, who produces milk uh, um, for his progeny, he, he produces, the cow produces milk uh, more than is needed, not just for the calf, but extra milk, more milk than is needed for that calf. 
I think of the bee uh, or bees. Um, the bees store a larger quantity of honey than is required. Um, then I think about the vine, uh, whether it be a, a, a pumpkin vine or um, a cucumber vine, uh, it produces a fruit whose exceptional excess of nourishment or nourish nourishment is intended that several cucumbers come, become on that vine and it's all there for the benefit of man. It's not just one. And then in each of those cucumbers, there are seeds that more may be produced. It's amazing when we look at nature, how nature produce overwhelmingly. <laughs> Follow me now. From the cow to the bee to the vine, the grape vine, for instance, they all produce uh, plentifully. Uh, and yet, when it comes to man, <laughs> we have to ask the question, how are we doing? Not just man, but to Christians, to Christians, to so-called Christians. How is our production? What are we producing? Now, if fruits or vegetables fail to to propagate itself, the fruit would soon be extinct. <laughs> and, no, and no doubt, some already are in that condition, no longer exist. Now, let me say that again, because I, I, I got a question that I, I like for you to ponder. If fruits or vegetables fail to propagate themselves, then that fruit would soon become extinct. What is going to happen to our church, I wonder? When we look around <laughs> and, and see the lack of fruit, character and souls, how are we doing? And how long can this church, our church, exist if we're if we aren't producing anything now i don't mean in our own strength no and no, i don't go there that's not what i'm talking about uh, because just as surely as uh the, the the cow doesn't produce milk in its own strength the bee doesn't produce honey in its own strength i'm i let's stay practical here the, uh, the vine doesn't produce uh, cucumbers and grapes of its own. It all comes from God, yes, but it produces nevertheless. Now the question is that if you and I don't produce the character that he says that we ought to bring forth fruit for his honor and his glory, then what happens to the church in the world? We are to be that light. If we don't bear fruit in bringing souls to him, if we don't have that intentionality and do that by his grace, then what happens to God's church? If we continue at the very same pace that we're going right now, where will this church, this congregation be in 10 years? Now, Listen to this <laughs> as you think about that. Now, a vine looks very nice. You know, it's beautiful uh, going over to Eastern Washington sometimes and, and looking at those, uh, th those orchards over there, just marvelous, uh, ornate, if you please, just very nice. Um, but this is the beauty, the, the, the grandeur of looking at it is subordinate to the great purpose of producing grapes and fruit. Now, it, it, it's beautiful seeing all these wonderful faces on the screen on Sabbath morning. It's wonderful seeing all of these wonderful faces in the congregation on Sabbath morning. But at some point, church, it has to go beyond the beauty of seeing. 
work with me, pray with me this morning. Uh, God's glory is the chief end of man. Herein, the text says, is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. It is fruit that Christ wants and not works, but fruit. Now, I say that in context as you, uh, you, you might go to Galatians chapter uh, 5 and then consider verses 1 through 26, the whole chapter in essence. But in near the end of that chapter, uh, the Apostle Paul, again, makes a distinction, a contrast between the works, works, works of flesh, and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this contrast, as you see there, is very distinct in Galatians 5. Uh, I might look there for a moment to get my bearing, if I may. Uh, uh, it simply says that the fruit of the Spirit, you know, well, look back. Look, look. it says, first of all, the works of the flesh, starting at verse 19. The works of the flesh are these. And then it goes on to enumerate uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, avarice, avarice uh, uh, emulation, wrath, strife, etc., envy and murder. It goes on with all the sin problem. Works, wickedness, works of the flesh. That's not what he wants. What does he want? He wants the fruit of the spirit. But these he's looking for, love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, meekness, faith, and temperance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is what he's looking for. So moreover, when it comes to fruit, like, uh, like a peach, let's take a peach. Uh, just looking at the simple fruit. There is the fleshly, uh, a fleshy, succulent part of the fruit. That would be classified or, uh, as character, that we are bringing forth character. And then uh, there is in the fruit a seed, which would be there is that embryo to bring forth souls for the development of a kingdom. So when we say fruit, we see the, the, the flesh or the meat, uh, the succulent part. And then down at the heart of that is the seed, the embryo that gives life, that perpetuates itself. It's embedded in the core. <laughs> yes, it's, it's embedded in the core. And, and, and I smile a little bit because I'm thinking that um, um, as we think about the seed, the fruit, the, 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 the fleshly, meatly, juicy, succulent part that you get to, to nurse on and to, that nourishes us, then there is a seed that we don't eat, but the seed is there to reproduce. Uh, the reason I was laughing because now we have all these seedless uh, fruits. Um, you know, I, 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 came, I, I, I came from the watermelon capital of the world, Paisland, South Carolina, the watermelon capital of the world, it used to be uh, anyway. And, and I remember very vividly that uh, when we would burst those watermelons, not necessarily cutting them, but just out in the field in the patch, as we say down south, in the patch, picking those watermelons, we would burst them right in the field and then just put our hands in it with all those seeds. And part of the fun was, was just eating it with our hands and seeds and all and spitting the seeds out. And sometimes we would have uh, spit fights with seeds and things like that. But now <laughs> we have seedless watermelons. What is that? Seedless watermelons, seedless grapes, seedless oranges, uh, seedless everything. Uh, even seedless Christians. <laughs> Look at that. Seedless Christians. It, it, it's body equivalent to having a seedless pomegranate. <laughs> if you like pomegranate, I was, I, was, I was thinking about that last night and I looked it up and said, maybe there is such thing as a seedless pomegranate. And you know what? I looked it up and what I discovered was that, that for 2,000 years, there have been seedless pomegranates. Uh, imagine that, and, and the word is that the seed is kind of soft, it's still there, but it's somehow uh, deteriorated or soft and it's not much of a seed at all. Therefore, they call it seedless. But when we start to think about seedless fruit, just 
the meat and you can be a nice, good person. And there's a lot of good people that aren't even Christians. As a matter of fact, some of the good people who are not even Christians will put some of us to shame. But then they don't have that connection to the vine with Christ that makes that goodness really count. They don't have that connection that they also have the seed, that embryo within to bring forth life and reproduce itself. What is going to happen to the church if we don't propagate uh, uh, ourselves? Will we go extinct? You know, I, I think of the, uh, the heirloom uh, seed, uh, Brother Tobin, uh, you probably deal a lot with that, looking for the heirloom seed. Now we have the hybrid and the, the GMO seed. And these are some of those so-called seeds that produce uh, a seedless watermelons and seedless grapes and all this types of thing. But those heirloom seeds that go back 50 years, thousands of years, they go back that this seeds produce more seeds. That's how we ought to be as God's people, producing more and more. You see, this fleshy part is for nourishment. The seed is intended to perpetuate the plant. The fleshly part is for nourishment. And the seed is for perpetuating the plant. Fruit serves two purposes even in the spiritual world. I think of holiness and usefulness, two purposes. See, personal holiness is uh, the succulent nourishing portion, uh, delighting God and man. And embedded in it is the seed of usefulness, righteousness and helpfulness. Covered with his affectionate righteousness, it is a sweet aroma in the nostrils of God and man and rooted in the seed of helpfulness, brokenness, and faithfulness. In personal brokenness, it is a contrite heart which God will not despise, surrounded in sorrow for sin and fixed in the seed of faithfulness. See, fruit does not uh, grow by accident. Fruit is cultivated. Yeah, we get some that just hap hap haphazardly grow out. I say haphazardly, but God is the producer of the fruit <laughs> that we see out there. The, let me head toward a conclusion. As we think about this beautiful fruit for which we've been called and expected to produce, my, my final question to us is this, at least I think it's my final question. So what do we do when what we have chosen does not perform to our expectation? What is it that you and I do when what we've chosen does not perform to our expectation? The, the, um, Urbane Dictionary would, 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 would phrase it this way, we chunk it. <laughs> uh, in other words, we trash it, we sell it, we, we, we throw it away, we put it aside, we give it away, we destroy it. Whatever we do, we don't keep it. As I was alluding to earlier, the, the apricot tree that I had uh, purchased, I kept it for a few years and it didn't produce. As a matter of fact, in the backyard uh, a couple of summers ago, I cut down two trees. Uh, one uh, was, uh, was, was a cherry tree because it became diseased and it just wasn't producing as it should. So I eventually cut it down, I waited a while. It never got better. I tried nourish, nourishing it and taking care of it, but it never got better. I had a peace tree, same thing, same problems, uh, but, and it failed to produce and while I was patient with it for a while, eventually I cut it down and got rid of it. John 15, that same chapter we started in, says if it does not produce, that he will cut it down and cast it into the fire. 
that it might be burned. In Luke chapter 13, verse 6 to 9, there's a parable in there that uh, Christ talks about uh, the tree that failed to produce. And he says, uh, why need it to cumber the ground? Why is it taking up space? I don't need it to do that. I want it to bring forth fruit. And if it's not going to bring forth fruit, then get rid of it. And then the, the worker in the vineyard comes and says, but master, uh, give it one more year and let me fertilize it. Let me uh, dung, you know, put around, dig around it and, and fertilize it and do all I can. And then next year, if it does not produce, then cut it down, throw it away. So that's what we must consider. One, rehearsing. We, you and I were chosen. We were chosen with a purpose, with a plan. God called us. It's not accident that we are here where we are today. We have been specifically chosen and called as much as Paul was called on the road to Damascus and chosen. As much as we were when we were born, that it was not an accident. God planned for you and for me to be right here where we are today. Why? So that we could bring forth fruit, character and producing for his church, growing his church, both because he has millions out there in the world that he wants to bring in. And you and I are the catalyst for doing that. And if you and I aren't going to do it, then he needs to trash us. He needs to get rid of us. He needs to put us aside and away. And we will ultimately be destroyed and thrown into the fire because we have not produced as he has expected us to, in character and in uh, bearing fruit for his kingdom. So in closing, I submit to you this behavior purpose. Cultivate the habit of abiding in him. This is what I'd like for you to do with, 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 that, uh, with that quote. Look at chapter 15. Now go back and covenant, if you will, to read verses 1 through 16. John 15, 1 through 16. I think maybe 10 or 11 times the word abide is used there. And Elder Murphy, I think this might be one of your favorite chapters, looking at the vine and abiding in it. This is what we're talking about. Cultivate the habit of abiding in him. And as we do that, as we stay nestled under his wings, he will work in us to produce the fruit of character as well as the fruit of adding to his church daily. May God help us as we endeavor to cultivate the habit of abiding in him so that we might bring forth fruit for his glory under his wings. Let's listen to the hymn now, if you will. Thank you.
Our Father in heaven, let that be each of us today, learning more and more how to safely abide, abide under the shadow of the Almighty, abide under your wings, O oh God. We bless you and thank you for choosing us. <laughs> Sometimes we think that we've chosen you, but long before that point, you have chosen us. And we thank you for not giving up on us when yet we have failed to produce fruit. God, we want to do better. We want to make ourselves available for what it is that you want to do in us and for us and through us for the advancement of your kingdom. Oh God, as we abide with you, do it for your name's sake, we pray. We thank you for blessing us today with your presence. In Jesus' name we ask it, amen.